Hi, so now I'm going to um, take these next few minutes to show you that there's another way of thinking, and just because I'm from New York and have an accent, we can all <laughs> embrace maybe what I'm saying today. So one of the things we always think about when we start any type of medication on a patient is we want to make sure that it works. And some of the ways that we think about the success of a drug is how a patient responds, um, our experience with the, with the drug, um, the particular presentation of a patient, and we decide how we should dose things according to perhaps the severity of uh, the disease. But what I would say to you is that there are some other ways that we can actually think of uh, serving our patients better rather than us just guessing. So we shall begin. All right, so why do we consider drug monitoring? Well, we know that at least 50% of the patients who had initial response to uh, a drug uh, seem to lose response after a while. They lose it, there's a loss of response for a number of things, including serious adverse events, uh, but there are other things that we define for loss of uh, response in that the pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics are different. So specifically for the pharmacokinetics, there can be inadequate drug concentrations, which um, can come from rapid clearance. So we certainly know that patients who have active colitis, um, another surrogate marker, as we saw before, was low albumins, that they seem to dump uh, a lot of their monoclonal antibody into their stool if they have active disease. They can also develop, develop uh, anti-drug antibodies, because remember this is still, as much as we can human or humanize it, it's still a foreign protein, and therefore we can make antibodies against it. There are other non-immune mechanisms, so it could be somebody's genetics and how they clear things out. And then as far as pharmacodynamics, there may be some non-anti-TNF-driven uh, pathways that we need to think about, and therefore something like infliximab, lizumab, et cetera, may not be the right drug for them because they have another mechanism, another pathway of immune dysfunction such that we might think about something uh, such as vetalizumab where we're thinking about the alpha-4, beta-7 pathway. So there's a number of things that we have to keep in our minds about our choices of what type of drug that might be most successful. And remember, too, that at the beginning, the first drug that you introduce or, or um, use on a patient should be the one that you hope you will have the best success with. So do we choose reactive monitoring in that, that we're just responding to something? So a patient begins to get some type of uh, symptoms, maybe they're not feeling well, they're increasing stools, or maybe they're becoming more anemic, their CRP is up. Or perhaps maybe before that even happens, before there's any structural damage, do we say to ourselves, well, how could we potentially prevent some structural damage? So that would be in those patients where we might target, uh, target a drug level um, while they're actually in clinical remission. So the question is, do you want to react to a problem after it arises? Or perhaps we should be rethinking this and being more proactive and being more in the mind of preventing uh, problems. <clears throat> So which would you prefer? Would you like somebody to throw you a, um, a life tube, or would you like somebody to say to you, you know what, I think you should put a life jacket on? And I would tell you, I think proactive monitoring is the way to go. So um, as Dr. Patel had gone over so eloquently, TDM is something that we've been doing actually for a long period of time. We know it's an essential part of treat to target, that empiric dosing uh, escalation in the setting of symptoms might be questionable because after all, it may not necessarily be that you don't have enough drug on board. It could be that you have something else going on. It could be a surgical problem. It could be just irritable bowel syndrome. So we know that we're already doing TDM for a number of things. So for instance, our, um, our pediatric neurologists or adult neurologists don't wait for somebody to have a seizure before they check the drug level. They actually keep them within a range so that they can prevent a seizure. Antibiotic coverage, many of us um, who are uh, uh, have our patients in the hospital where they have to have certain levels of vancomycin or gentamicin, we check that not only for drug efficacy to take care of the potential infection, but also to screen for toxicity. In, in uh, ulcerative colitis, a long time ago, we started using cyclosporin before we had the uh, monoclonal antibodies, and we knew that there was a target range such that that patient might not um, go on to colectomy so quickly or perhaps keeping them in better control than um, just on steroids alone. 
in Crohn's disease, we did the same thing, right? So we learned a lot that there are certain levels of 6MP that we should be targeting that would give us a better chance of having clinical remission. And finally, even in the solid organ transplants, they don't wait for somebody to reject their kidneys or to reject their livers. They actually keep them within some therapeutic uh, window of whatever medication they're using to immunosuppress for ongoing rejection. So as we said before, there is therapeutic drug monitoring. We do TPM testing to look for genetic polymorphisms. We want to avoid serious complications. It allows for some dose alteration. We knew, as before, as I said, that there was a certain level of 6-TGN that we were targeting. We also looked at the other metabolite, 6-MMP, where we knew that very high levels could potentially give us liver toxicity. And for those patients who we questioned their adherence, we could tell, like my teenagers, who don't always tell us the truth, that, oh yeah, I'm taking my 6-MMP. Okay, you do the level, and there's nothing. There's no 6-TGN, there's no 6-MMP, and so that could be another opportunity for TDM. And what about for biologics? Well, should we do this during induction? Should we check levels during maintenance? Should we check it during the decline of somebody's clinical status? Should we look for anti-drug antibodies? None, slightly increased, um, those that are increased. And then there are different types of assays that we can use. Again, looking at just uh, drug levels and antibodies, and those are the ELISAs and the mobility shifts. Okay, so it may be important to do this at the very beginning. So if you have a patient who you started a biologic on and you um, see that maybe they're not doing well, you want to know, is it really because the drug is not working or could there be something else? Or maybe it's not an anti-TNF problem. It may be that there's another immune pathway that's not working. You look for high antibodies, you look for low drug levels, you look for low antibodies and low drug levels that would tell you that you need dose escalation. <clears throat> Trough levels may also be important because you want to know whether there's secondary loss of response, uh, is there active UC. In those with perianal disease, we've come to understand that the drug levels probably need to be higher than those who do not have perianal disease. And what I'll show you in a bit, there are some um, early data that had showed us that we actually could see that there was some better responses if you had um, higher drug levels and no antibodies. So we'll take a look at that. So in the very beginning, and these were a couple of studies, and I'll show you some more, um, there, had com there had come to um, the conclusion that serum infliximab levels was a predictive factor for clinical outcomes for patients with ulcerative colitis. And as you can see um, over on the, wait, where's, is this the thing here? Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. Over here. So you can see over here that looking at both uh, drug level and antibody level, you could see that for remission, I put on my glasses, um, you could see that for remission that the levels of drug were actually higher and antibodies were less. But for those patients that had endoscopic improvement, you could also see that drug level was higher and there was less antibodies. But when you look at the bottom part, which was the colectomy rate, <clears throat> you could see that the antibodies were much higher considering what the drug level was. So again, showing you that, that you could make some predictive models and there was some um, importance in looking at whether you had antibody uh, levels that were high or low or drug levels that were high or low. Then looking at the association <clears throat> of trough serum and fliximab levels, looking at clinical outcomes for the maintenance of Crohn's disease, you can see on these plots that the open circle were patients who were on fliximab and had the durability of more than 52 weeks versus the gray one where they were off. And as you can see, remission was much better in those patients um, who had infliximab level on board and that those patients who, um, again, were um, off of it, you could see that over time their CRP level didn't change, but those who had durability actually showed an improvement, and then for endoscopic appearance as well. So again, showing you that if you had good drug levels and you had no antibodies, that you were much more likely to have a better outcome over time. 
There are other studies now from pediatrics looking at that antibody infliximab levels were actually um, associated with an increased likelihood of surgery. So um, up in Boston Children's, they took a look at all the patients who, who they were doing um, infliximab infusions on, and they looked at their levels, and they were actually able to show that in those patients who went on to surgery, whether you had ATI levels or not ATI levels, the ones you were 60% or 60% of the patients who went on to the surgery actually had high uh, uh, anti-drugs to infliximab versus those who did not. So again, showing you the likelihood that if you had high drug le- uh, high uh, antibody levels that you were more likely to go on to surgery. And then, again, in another study looking at drug levels, they showed that even postoperatively in patients with Crohn's disease, that if you were to look at the different levels that you were more likely to wind up with more complications um, post-surgical if you had um, the lower amount of drug level on board. Another study looking again at optimization, again a pediatric study where they took a look at uh, ATI levels and again they had shown that those with ATI, um, those without ATI had a 92.3% had a detectable level of um, infliximab. Those with an ATI had, had 38% had a detectable level, so showing you a threefold difference. And they noted that those who had increased ATIs had a lower infliximab level, as we would note, and that the investigators also suggested that maybe we should really be thinking about infliximab monitoring um, for long-term outlook. Um, again, just looking at another, looking at therapeutic drug monitoring, looking at pathways, sort of suggesting that there may be a therapeutic uh, window that we should be looking at, and again, showing that the higher the levels, the more likely that you would stay in clinical remission. And then there was an algorithm, as we've seen before in other studies, how you might be able to think about this. Again, another study showing that um, during maintenance, so not just induction, showing that the higher level of drug that you had on board was um, correlated with endoscopic remission and better histologic remission, so therefore deep remission. And again, just showing us that the importance of looking at drug levels as, as a way of taking care of your patients. So my question is, with all of these studies, why not measure what a patient's drug level is? And even though I'm from New York, we don't print money there. (laughs) Okay. So um, one of uh, the investigators that has really written a lot, Dr. Papa Michael, um, has showed that improved clinical outcomes of patients with infliximab. And what he really looked at uh, was looking at long-term outcome of patients uh, with IBD undergoing proactive versus reactive monitoring. So it was a multi-center study retrospective. There were 264 patients that they followed who had been receiving maintenance. So again, remember, there's a way to dr- uh, measure drug level during induction and another during maintenance. And so it was essentially split into two. And what they did is over about seven or nine years, essentially, they started looking at um, ATI levels and drug level. They analyzed the tr- what, their, what they were analyzing was the time to treatment failure, their first IBD surgery or hospitalization, any um, infusion reactions, and detection of ATI. And treatment failure was defined as the discontinuation of the drug for loss of response or serious adverse ev- uh, event or surgery. And their uh, conclusion was that proactive monitoring was associated with better outcomes, including greater drug durability, less need for IBD surgery, hospitalization, and lower risk for ATIs or SIRs. And so they took a look at the big group, and so A was actually all of the people with IBD. And in um, you can see that the proactive arm was the um, not the hatch line, but the straight line. And you could see that the Kaplan-Meier curve, so either for Crohn's disease and B or in uh, ulcerative colitis C, that over time there was a definite greater um, success if there had been some proactive monitoring in this patient's treatment. Other outcomes such as surgery, again, you could see the proactive arm did much better than that with the reactive arm. And again, even for um, IBD-related hospitalizations, the same thing. Then looking at um, at the detectability of uh, anti-drug antibody to infliximab and even serious infusion reactions, again, proactive monitoring was superior um, than reactive monitoring and watching these patients over time. So again, just showing us certainly early on 
Um, within the first few years, this became quite essential. Another study by the same author um, looked at what happened about the long-term um, outcomes of patients who were initially followed with reactive monitoring, and then based on those patients, they split them into two groups, um, afterwards looking at proactive versus reactive testing. And so again, multi-center cohort was over a nine-year period, looking um, during maintenance and the long-term outcomes, again, pretty much the same treatment failure, hospitalization, and then IBD-related surgery. There are 102 patients who were initially followed with reactive and then split into two groups. And as you can see, treatment failure, again, showing that proactive monitoring really had a better outcome than did the rest, uh, the reactive monitoring over time, and showing that as um, each of the patients went on how they did. And then looking at treatment failure versus Crohn's versus UC, for sure, over time, it was way better for the Crohn's disease, but early on showed um, some help in ulcerative colitis. Again, looking at surgery and hospitalization, again showing that having proactive monitoring had much better outcomes in surgeries, um, and the same thing for IBD-related hospitalization. So in the TAXIS study, we showed that patients who were proactive actually had less anti-drug antibody development, that there was less uh, rescue therapy that was needed and a better chance of achieving therapeutic drug troughs. So what are the benefits of proactive monitoring? So now just thinking in our minds. So, you know, again, if we are looking for clinical symptoms, then we also understand that clinical symptoms can be very de uh, deceiving for not only the practitioner, but for the patient themselves. So you can have somebody who has really bad IBS and not having any structural damage, and that may be the reason why you get the phone call. Or there could be some patients who you know, when you scope them, they never complain, they're in for maybe surveillance, and you look in and you see an awful terminal ileum, or you see much more in the colon, and you say, I'm really surprised this patient didn't call me. So what I would say to you is that's an unreliable way to follow your patients. And then two, if by the time there really is pain because of inflammation, you now may have inflammation inflammation and destruction to the tissue that may be irreversible. And we don't know exactly at this point when we can judge someone as far as their symptoms or their mucosal damage based on symptoms, and therefore I would really say that looking at um, drug levels may be a way to help. So short term, we know that if we are able to look at that, we can have a better, maybe early clinical response. We can perhaps prevent ADAs, and we can understand a patient's unique pharmacokinetics. So we certainly said, as Dr. Patel said before, obesity, male gender, disease activity um, may be something that influences the way somebody handles their drug. But I would say to you that in pediatrics, we certainly know that during the pubertal period that we see much more variability in a patient's pharmacokinetics than we might see them when they turn 20 or 22. And long term, if we're able to do a good job at actually monitoring these patients, not only with their clinical symptoms and following them endoscopically, but we may be able to avoid future relapse, which of course is very important for school and for jobs, but um, we can also keep them perhaps out of the hospital, which is a cost savings. We can keep them further from maybe ever having surgery or maybe having surgery somewhere later on down the line. But the first drug that you use, you should covet it because we still, although we have so many new drugs in the pipeline, you should make success at it and optimize it. You want to make sure you're giving enough and that you're preventing antibodies. And that you want to have confidence that, you know, maybe after a while, patients don't always need this level of drug. Or maybe they don't always need an anti-TNF. And so is there an opportunity with looking at uh, drug level and anti-drug antibodies that maybe there may be a few patients that we can actually take off of a drug and maybe give them a drug holiday if that's even possible. So what would you rather be, reactive where you're drowning, or maybe you'd like to be proactive and look far ahead and we should be the lifeguard monitors of our patients and really make sure we keep them away from any danger than just waiting for them to have a problem. Thank you.